Good evening. It's Thursday night, and we've got with us tonight Dr. Gerald Horn. He is a researcher. He is an author of many books. He's a historian. He's a great friend. Dr. Gerald Horn, we're fortunate. Let's talk. Carlin Nixon here with Dr. Gerald Horn. If you looked at the um, thumbnail, you'll notice I put up my favorite book, Paul Robeson, The Artist and Revolutionary, Dr. Gerald Horn, author of how many books do you have out now, Dr. Horn? Oh, I'd say a few dozen. A few, a few dozen. One or two, huh? Well, tonight, let's add a, a little. We'll add a an audible book to the collection. Let's start. We got a lot of going. We got enough to have us uh, shivering in our seats. But uh, maybe if we talk about it, um, I've often heard the cure for fear is action. So we're going to do some kind of action tonight. Let's start here. We're still not out of the woods, shall we say, in um, West Asia as um, Iran has struck Israel. Um, and now Israel seems to be contemplating a um, uh, an attack on Iran of some manner. There's, you know, we're hearing about Israel's allies saying, don't do it, kind of horrifying. Of course, Iran's making it clear there will be a heavy price to pay. Where are we now, Dr. Gerald Horn? Your thoughts on all of this, th on this mess? Well, rather cleverly, I'm afraid to say, Israel might be able to bail itself out of the crisis it finds itself in. What I mean by that is news reports of late suggest that the Israelis are trying to cut a deal with the Biden administration, where in return for not attacking Iran, which I don't think they were going to do because it would have opened the gates of hell, uh, perhaps uh, jeopardized the very existence of the Zionist state. But in return for pulling back from that front, the, they received a go-ahead to go into the Rafa crossing, uh, that is to say, the border region between Gaza and Egypt. And this means that Palestinian blood is going to be shed more profusely, perhaps, than it has been shed to this juncture. And that should chill us all. Let's step back for a moment and try to assess where we are with the crisis accelerating on April 1st, 2024, when the Israeli authorities bombed the Iranian legation in Damascus, Syria, uh, executing a number of leading Iranian military officials. The Iranians strike back on April 13th, just a few days ago, by sending hundreds of projectiles uh, into Israel. Despite the happy talk in New York and Washington and Israel about uh, this uh, fusillade of missiles and drones not causing any damage. And as Tom Friedman in the New York Times has said, the only folks who died were those who died from laughing at the alleged ineptitude of the Iranians, according to Tom Friedman. But more sober reporting has exposed that what the Iranians were able to do was suss out, in a sense, the Israeli defensive capabilities by sending uh, all of these projectiles into Israeli authorities, exposing the frailties of the hyped Iron Dome system, uh, not to mention inflicting severe damage on Israeli military and intelligence facilities. The Iranians have made it clear that if the Israelis are so audacious as to try to respond, well, then uh, all bets are off. Uh, Katie bar the door. Uh, as noted, uh, Israel will be in for a major pasting. And as you probably know more than most, uh, what this episode reveals is that once again, the Israelis have found themselves in the anomalous position 
of attaining a kind of tactical victory in the face of a strategic defeat. That's the import of Gaza, where they killed thousands of Hamas fighters, we are told at least, a tactical victory at best, but losing the strategic battle in terms of their tattered global image. And likewise, the apparent tactical victory of April 1st now being overwhelmed by the fact that Iran has established a muscular deterrence that in league with their allies in southern Lebanon, speaking of Hezbollah and in Yemen and in Syria, uh, presents a formidable challenge uh, to the Israeli authorities. And this pattern of tactical victories overwhelmed by strategic defeats, in my estimation, is an emblem of this new paradigm we're facing globally, whereby no longer can the Israelis and their patrons in Washington basically establish uh, rules of the game that there is a new kid on the block, speaking of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, soon to be joined by Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and United Arab Emirates. Uh, by some measures, they're already surpassing the economies of the group of seven, the United States, Western European nations accompanied by Japan. And when you have that basic Copernican shift in the global correlation of forces, it makes it well nigh impossible to attain strategic victories. <clears throat> and that is what uh, Israel is encountering, uh, whether they know it or not. And uh, we should also mention that this is going to be a rude awakening for the Zionist lobby in the United States of America, uh, who to this point have had a vert veritable stranglehold on the two major parties. Uh, that is to say, you have billionaires like Chaim Saban of Hollywood fame, Egyptian Jewish origin, a major donor to the Democratic Party. And then you have the Adelson family of Las Vegas and Macau, People's Republic of China, gambling interests, Dallas Mavericks basketball team interests, who are major donors to Mr. Netanyahu's party and to the GOP, particularly Mr. Trump. And they're accustomed to getting their way, but now they're going to have to adjust to a part in the expression, new world order, where they do not necessarily get their way. And unsurprisingly, in the face of this setback, we begun to see the resuscitation of what could fairly well be called ancient hatreds. So what I'm referring to is the fact that uh, of late, uh, the right-wing congressman from Texas, Dan Crenshaw, has rebuked Tucker Carlson, the Fox News host, because Carlson was criticizing the Israelis for supposedly being repressive in their approach to Christians in their vicinity. Uh, this was followed or has been accompanied by the conservative black woman flamethrower Candace Owens getting into a rift with her erstwhile comrade Ben Shapiro, a card-carrying member of the Zionist lobby, with her playing the Christian card as well. And I think that given the weakness of progressive movements in this country, without uh, at all uh, issuing a, a slander with regard to their heroic role in the streets of late, the fact is that uh, it would not be a surprise to many of us if in this context, these religious tensions begin, begin to uh, percolate, uh, which does not bode well for the body politic of the United States of America. And so you see as well, speaking of the previous point concerning the heroism of the progressive movement in the face of certain ideological weaknesses and organizational weaknesses, uh, you, you see that at Columbia University as we speak, where pro-Palestinian demonstrators are being rounded up by the New York Police Department uh, in echoes of 1968 when the campus came to a halt in the face of massive student protests. Uh, this was preceded by an ignominious appearance on Capitol Hill by the Columbia University president who casually threw overboard faculty uh, because 
uh, alleged uh, anti-Jewish fervor, which obviously uh, is uh, defamatory with regard to these faculty. But obviously she did not want to follow the fate of President Claudine Gay of Harvard, or former President Claudine Gay, I should say, who after a similar appearance on Capitol Hill was driven out of office, or the president of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Liz McGill, who suffered a, a similar fate. Now, the president of Columbia may not be driven out of office by the right wing, but she may be driven out of office by the left wing. And this has been accompanied by the rather ominous remarks of Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, who has suggested that uh, pro-Palestinian demonstrators should be subjected to violence. Uh, I don't think that that kind of advice was necessary because it's already been happening. And we also see that many of the shibboleths of U.S. contemporary political culture have been exposed. We hear this uh, nostrum about so-called cancel culture, but then we see it in practice when the commencement speaker, the valedictorian of the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, a pro-Palestinian activist with a 3.98 grade point average out of 4.0, is prevented from giving the traditional talk at commencement because of threats from Zionist thugs. In other words, the administration of USC are capitulating to what in constitutional law is called a heckler's veto, which is supposed to be verboten since the authorities are supposed to privilege freedom of speech. But once again, a cancel culture to the extent that that uh, rather uh, suspect phrase has entered the lexicon is meant only to apply to those trying to cancel the right wing. Canceling the left wing is, is seen as acceptable, to put it mildly. And you see the same thing with regard to the previous point, Iran-Israel, uh, because obviously there's a double standard with regard to the so-called rules-based international order there's hypocrisy that stinks to high heaven. That is to say that Israel can violate all manner of international law by attacking a legation of Iran in Syria and its allies and patrons at the United Nations Security Council prevent any condemnation uh, compelling Iran to act on its own. Once again, a tactical victory uh, for the bad guys and a strategic defeat at the same time. And yet Iran is now being threatened with tightened sanctions. So obviously there is apartheid in the international community. There is hypocrisy in the international community. There's one set of rules for one set of players, another set of rules for another set of players. And this is unsustainable in the long run, uh, which is one of the reasons why this small planet is in the midst of a severe crisis. Speaking of a se severe crisis, I'm looking on Twitter. I'm not sure it is possible that there's something, I'm seeing different things, that it's possible unconfirmed explosions in Iran so we don't know. It is possible as we speak right now that um, Israel is taking action against Iran. I guess this will come. And if so, we know Iran's going to strike back and certainly will, you know, it is what it is. We'll, we'll figure that out as, as it goes. One of the things I think that is critical, your thoughts on, and I'll keep an eye on this from Twitter. We'll see what we see. Um, the... Uh, ability of not just Iran, but other states now to um, take advantage of, to get past the Western air defense systems to, uh, as an example, it wouldn't be plausible now for the U.S. to argue that their air defense system could protect Taiwan or one of their other allies from a, someone much more powerful than China. Um, your thoughts on the effect of Iran being able to effectively attack, uh, to strike Israel, 
even as the U.S. and its allies and the Iron Dome and David and all the David Sling, all of those things together, all of those together tried to stop Iran. Iran was still able to effectively um, demonstrate there that they could they could they could reach out and touch Israel. The effect of do you think that has any other effect worldwide when it comes to other potential adversaries of the you know or the neocons? I guess everybody who doesn't capitulate to them is an adversary. But your thoughts on that? Well, clearly it, it has uh, multiple repercussions uh, with regard to Taiwan, as you suggested. Also in the marketplace, uh, the Russian S-400 system, uh, which is a defensive system intended to shoot down missiles, or uh, if it were a stock, you would have to go long on it right now because obviously it is more effective uh, than the competitive systems from the United States of America. Uh, speaking of which, what you're referring to also exposes the frailty of military procurement in the United States of America. That is to say that the military procurement, as the Ukraine crisis shows, has not been effective in producing artillery shells, which has obviously put Ukraine in a bad way, particularly since the Russians, uh, backed up by North Korea, uh, have no such problem. And yet, because you have companies like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, which have a stranglehold on Congress, who can put, put their placemen into high level positions at the Pentagon, it's very difficult for the United States to shift to try to produce what countries need for their security. Instead, they're producing what Raytheon and Lockheed Martin need for their bottom line. And this is contributing to this deepening crisis in Israel. You may have heard the latest news that Ronan Bergman, who is a well-sourced Israeli reporter at Times, reports for the New York Times, has suggested that if Israelis had been able to listen in on the hysteria at in the war cabinet at, and at the highest levels on April 13th and April 14th, 2024, that four million might have jumped on the next plane out of David Ben-Gurion Airport to head to Australia, to head to the United States, to uh, head to uh, Western Europe. And this bespeaks the crisis in the Israeli economy uh, with uh, many in southern Lebanon abandoning that region, uh, heading northward where they have to be put up in hotels and motels at the government's expense, and ditto likewise for northern Lebanon, subject to Hezbollah missiles, not to mention the reservists who ordinarily uh, stock grocery shelves and sit in cubicles, now wielding weapons uh, in Gaza. So Israel is headed or is in the midst of a major crisis. It's not apparent that their uh, Zionist uh, billionaire allies uh, in North America uh, can rescue them. And that latter point brings me to another question that we really need to address sooner rather than later. Uh, what I mean is that ordinarily uh, in classrooms from the Atlantic to the Pacific, a kind of national chauvinist history is taught whereby the United States and the system it constructed, the settler colonial system, is seen as superior to what many of the migrants left behind in Europe. And exhibit A in that regard is the apparent embrace of the Jewish diaspora, whereas we know the Jewish community in Europe was subject to banishment, inquisitions, Holocaust, and all the rest. But what that ignores is the fact that under settler colonialism, the rulers needed as many settlers who could be defined as, quote, white, unquote, as they could muster in order to confront rebellious Native Americans and obstreperous enslaved Africans. And so therefore, obviously, they were embraced and were allowed to rise to a certain degree, admittedly with bumps along the road in terms of what we even see today in terms of the rise of uh, anti-Jewish incidents. But I think that that rather brief history lesson should be sobering 
and should also lead to a jettisoning of the kind of ordinary, customary uh, national chauvinist history that is spread promiscuously in our classrooms uh, to the detriment of political understanding. You know what I think is is important, and particularly what you said. What I th what what you said right now, I think, is particularly important in the context of um, what's you know the things that are going on right now in Israel and the philosophical foundation of Zionism of Israel. That it's a safe place. It's a safe space, as the young people say. You know, try to say right now, right? Jew you're you're a Jewish person. Why you can't be safe in America? You can't be safe in Europe. You can't be safe anywhere. But we've got a place right here and you can be safe. All Jewish people around the world, you're safe from anti-Semitism, come here. That is the foundation, the philosophical foundation, I think, of the having this Jewish state. Now, when the statement came out that if the people of Israel could listen to what was going on in these inner work conversations in the inner, at the highest level of government, they would, um, they'd be out of here. There's a number of ways to interpret it. I interpreted it as if they understood that we really can't defend them, that if Iran wanted to knock the daylights out of us, out, we don't have enough missiles. We've figured out that they can hit us and we can't stop us. They realize that they're kind of naked. They're not safe and they'll leave, which leads me to believe, let's say for the sake of argument, that what's going that right now, there is some exchange of fire, shall we say. And the likelihood, certainly, Iran has said what they're going to do. There's the exchange of fire in the other direction, and Israel takes a pretty good hit. If the foundation is safety, and as whoever this leaker said, who may have been trying to give them no, an early notice of what was going to happen if they engaged in a confrontation with Iran, it seems to me that they're signing their own death warrant because so many Israelis have dual citizenship. And if you're sitting in a country and drones and missiles are coming in and you have citizenship and you got a house in New Jersey, they're going to forget what the Iranians can do or anyone else. The natural course of things is that so many people will leave. They won't have a viable economy and a viable country, which it seems that they are quickly uh, 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 moving in that direction. Your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Well, what you're saying reminds me of a response to a column in the Washington Post a few days ago, the column by Ruth Marcus, a pro-Zionist columnist who ordinarily reports on the US Supreme Court, but took a junket to Israel in the last month or so, and came back with the usual cliches about the plucky Israelis standing tall in the face of a new possible Holocaust and all the rest. And I would point your audience to a response to that Marcus column by a Jewish studies professor at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, who reprimanded Ruth Marcus because according to this scholar uh, who is not of European descent, but is of Jewish descent, she says that Ruth Marcus's column, like Zionism as a whole, too often reflects the concerns and the history of European Jewry, as opposed to the significant percentage of the Jewish population of Israel, which has roots in Morocco to Iraq, to Iran, for example. And although their lives prior to 1947 and 1948, uh, was no crystal stare, uh, to quote that uh, phrase, it certainly did not rise to the level of the Inquisition in Spain or the Holocaust in Central Europe. And in fact, uh, a good deal of the population that I just referred to had fled the Iberian Peninsula pre precisely because of the Inquisition which reached, interestingly enough, a kind of zenith in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And it, as you probably know, in order to compel many of the Mizrahi Jewish population in places like Iraq to flee their homelands, the Israeli authorities engaged in a number of dirty tricks, <laughs> including uh, phony bombings to intimidate and terrorize these folks and make them think 
that death was on their doorstep. And so that's one of the contradictions of the many contradictions that the Israeli authorities are going to have to grapple with uh, going forward. That is to say, a plummeting economy uh, combined with a severe ideological crisis uh, given the contradictions that are erupting within the heart of Zionism. Uh, uh, let me throw something else at you. And I think these things cannot be separated at this point. Um, Zelensky recently has come out and said, you know, I reported on it. Uh, why We need to be defended in the same way that you defended Israel. You know, the infamous, uh, uh, you know, you know, why are you treating um, your wife better than your mistress. The mistress, the mistress is not happy, right? So Zelensky is saying this is not fair. There's articles saying now. I've read articles that said that there are people in um, Ukraine that are getting upset, saying, "Wait a minute, you protect Israel and you leave us to the to be mauled by the Russian bear." Um, if in fact the things are going on now that we think that, then it certainly seems that. Ukraine will get less and less attention from U.S. imperialism. Your thoughts on the catastrophe that the disaster that the Biden administration finds themselves in having two hot wars on their watch that basically both of them, to some extent, could be described as U.S. proxies. Well, what you're illustrating is the dilemma faced by US imperialism, which would like to focus like a laser beam on China, but instead is bogged down in Ukraine, bogged down in Israel, perhaps soon to be bogged down in Iran. And yet they would like to focus on the South China Sea, which then brings me to an article in a recent edition of Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations by Matt Potenger, a former aide to Mr. Trump, tell it to be perhaps a national security advisor or even secretary of state in an incoming Trump regime in 2025, and Matt Gallagher, the hawkish congressman, where they basically counsel overthrowing the Chinese Communist Party, not least because it's China that's the strongest power within the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, which was represents the stiffest challenge to the hegemony of the United States and the North Atlantic countries plus Japan, but also because, as these writers put it, uh, a holy crusade against China would unite the wings of the U.S. ruling class, the Biden wing and the Trump wing, because they're both united in hawkishness towards China. And so rather than squabbling between and amongst each other, they would focus on squabbling with China. And that's the dilemma that Mr. Zelensky faces because as Speaker Mike Johnson is finding out, uh, there is no unanimity within his caucus with regard to further billions in aid to Ukraine. In fact, uh, if he pursues that matter further, uh, he may follow the trajectory of former Speaker Kevin McCarthy and be ousted altogether. Uh, that's the import of the papers filed by Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, backed up by Congressman Massey of Kentucky. And likewise, as represented by my previous comment concerning Candace Owens, Tucker Carlson, etc., cetera, uh, not to mention the activism of the U.S. left, uh, there's no unanimity of opinion with regard to backing Israel. Uh, in fact, uh, at the Democratic Party convention in Chicago, do not be surprised if there are raucous demonstrations, perhaps not reaching the level and intensity of 1968 when Vietnam was the hot button issue, but certainly uh, being sufficient to rock the world of one Joseph R. Biden. And so I understand why there's this concern about Ukraine amongst many Atlanticists, because there are those in Western Europe who feel that if the United States does not come through with further aid, then a permanent riff will be established within the North Atlantic community. Already, you see in response that 
that France and Britain are trying to repair their relationship. They had this phony anniversary of the Entente Cordiale of 1904, the 120th anniversary of that uh, short-term pact of unity between Paris and London. Uh, and I think it's a reflection of the fact that uh, they see perhaps an incoming Trump administration uh, that will further pull the rug out from under uh, Mr. Zelensky, uh, perhaps pull the rug from out, out from under uh, NATO itself. And that too could have repercussions and ramifications uh, with regard to European nations seeking to further arm themselves because they feel that they cannot rely upon the nuclear umbrella of Uncle Sam. But it's going to be a more than a notion for the European nations, absent U.S. support, to confront the Russian-China alliance. And so what Chancellor Schultz of Germany is doing this week by flying with a plane load of businessmen to Beijing to break bread with President Xi Jinping and try to revive the flagging German economy, forced to toe the line on Ukraine, uh, forced to give up a cheap energy from Russia, now having its arm twisted to back away from the vast market of China, uh, Mr. Schultz is thumbing his nose at that prospect, and that too will further uh, complexify relations between Berlin and Washington, perhaps not jeopardizing the Ramstein military base in Germany, one of the most important of the many US bases abroad, but certainly it sheds new light upon what we know is going on. The fact that the United States is establishing a brand spanking new military base in Romania on the Black Sea, perhaps looking to the day uh, when Ramstein will be put in mothballs. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is of consequence now that I'll think will be of even of greater consequence. Again, I think all these things go together. Um, Sergey Lavrov was in China a few weeks back. We reported on that. And um, he discussed building what they he referred to as a Eurasian security. I don't remember if the word was alliance. The implication was clear that Russia and China are considering something more formal. He also said with other like-minded um, with other like-minded uh, uh, nations. And if I could quickly, if you will give me one second, um, let me see. Oh, wait a minute. I know where to find it. Sorry. I will. I think it's critical that I get your thoughts on this particular this was in the global times after sergey lavrov left and spoke with um uh, uh the, his counterpart in china china uh china and russia will not target any third party but and this is critical now particularly what's going on between israel and um and 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 iran if hegemon if hegemonic forces threaten china and russia or threaten world peace, China and Russia will stand together and fight to protect their own interests and safeguard world peace. Now, there's also been rumors, strong rumors, that President Putin, well, we know he's good. It's been reported that he will be visiting China. The rumors are in May, which is sooner rather than later. In light of the um, fraught situation in uh, in the Middle East, your thoughts on this comment and the dynamics that are building here? Well, we know that the nightmare scenario, which is unfolding as we speak, is for a close relationship between Russia and China, the nightmare scenario for Washington and the North Atlantic countries. It was a nightmare scenario decades ago, which is one of the reasons why Washington spent so much time and effort trying to drive a wedge between China and the Soviet Union, to a certain extent succeeded uh, with Nixon's trip to China in 1972 and approximately 50 years later, in February 2022, with the trip of Putin to Beijing, 
and the then subsequently announced special military operation in Ukraine, uh, you saw that that energy expended on driving the wedge between Russia and China was coming to an eclipse. It was coming to a close. And given the fact that we know that decades ago, when the North Atlantic countries were comparatively stronger than they are today, that was seen as a nightmare scenario, then nightmare is really almost inadequate to describe uh, what the North Atlantic countries are about to witness with this uh, increasing close relationship between Russia and China. Uh, you might have noticed that in February 2024, uh, Russian economic growth apparently was 7%, believe it or not. Uh, the IMF proposes that in 2024, its economic growth will be overall over 3%, which is, for example, uh, more substantial than that of Germany, the locomotive of the European Union. We see that recently China announced economic growth figures of 5%. And despite uh, all of the premature burials of the Chinese economy, the notion that the real estate sector is imploding, that China will grow old before it gets rich, and the other cliches that are common currency in the Economist and the Financial Times of London, the fact of the matter is that the, these two giants keep going from strength to strength. Uh, I dare say that there would not be so many countries knocking on the door of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, if these scare stories in the Financial Times and The Economist uh, had any credibility. And so once again, to return to a theme of the past few minutes, the world is undergoing a fundamental <clears throat> Copernican shift in the global balance of forces, the likes of which we have not seen for a few centuries. Uh, this will make it very difficult, to put it euphemistically, for the North Atlantic countries to recover their former swag, that their future involves increasing strategic defeats, and Israel might be exhibit A in that regard. Um, one of the things, I, uh, another thing, I, and this is important, I'd like to ask you about is this, and th this is critical. You know, um, one of my guests, Jody Brar, spoke about Russia, right? And she said, look, if you're going to confront imperialism, you have to deliver for the people. You have to have the people behind you. And the Russian government has gone out of its way to make sure that the, the shelves are all stocked and the, you know, that that the people of Russia have, you know, the economies going, that they they've really gone out of the way to try to make sure that the, the, the people are behind them. And certainly with the latest um, election, we saw that that was working. On the other hand, right now, we've got the um, U.S. government, our ruling elite, pretty much, you know, unanimously supporting um, the Israeli regime. We see that uh, the people of the U.S. not behind that at all. In fact, the incumbent ruling party in the U.S., the last number I saw was somewhere around 66 percent of the people in the incumbent party, the Democratic Party, in opposition to the ruling elite of their party, the leadership of their party. I would suspect now that with what's going on, the price of petroleum will see a market increase, which if there's anything that's going to make Americans angry, it's going to be at the same time, you've got the price of gas likely to skyrocket. I would suspect that oil would be with these confrontations going up. You've got, which will, of course, push up inflation. Gas goes up. The chicken wings and biscuits go up also. Um, and the people are not behind Israel. This is a crisis of legitimacy for the ruling elite going into an election year. 
your thoughts on and the people are literally in the streets of the incumbent party are in the streets being dragged away by the police blocking the bridges um uh, uh, uh etc uh joe biden's fundraisers in an election year his fundraisers are being blocked and being um he's getting money from the billionaire Zionists at these fundraisers, but the actual people are outside the fundraisers protesting, calling him Genocide Joe. Your thoughts on this crisis of legitimacy for the ruling elite and how this, what this looks like to you, Dr. Horn? Well, the crisis takes many forms. Uh, you mentioned the upcoming presidential election, and I'm not sure how U.S. propagandists can continue to trumpet the alleged virtues of this so-called constitutional democracy when we have this Rube Goldberg type contraption known as the Electoral College, which allows those who receive a fewer number of votes, such as George W. Bush in 2000, such as Donald J. Trump in 2016, to actually triumph. And because of a certain interpretation of the Electoral College, uh, this has led to the companion maneuver, which is counseling those who are in the streets shouting Genocide Joe, on the one hand, to vote for Genocide Joe, on the other hand, uh, because they are being told that if they do not vote for Genocide Joe, a worse fate will ensue. Now, obviously, there are contradictions in that sort of of analysis, but one I would like to pick at right now is the fact that because of that kind of hypocritical cry, this has led many people on the left to rationalize voting for genocidaires, whereas it would probably be healthier for the body politic if they were to develop political alternatives electoral alternatives, for example, but that does not seem to be in the offing. But perhaps even more dangerous than that is what I've noticed from some of our friends in Europe. That is to say, their analysis is that the incumbent political party, is, to use your phrase, speaking of the Democrats, that their global strategy seems to be to confront Russia and China simultaneously, which to many of our friends in Europe seems like inking a suicide pact. Whereas Mr. Trump obviously wants to cut a deal with Russia and then focus on China like a laser beam. From the point of view of imperialist strategy, uh, Mr. Trump's approach seems more rational, which then leads many of our friends in Europe who are forced into the same sort of conundrum that our domestic friends are forced into with regard to trying to pick and choose from this duopoly, from the point of view of many of our European friends, the Republicans in terms of world peace seem to present a lesser challenge to war. That is to say more prone to pursue a policy uh, that will save Europe from war. <laughs> not necessarily the rest of the world. And so this is just part of the contradiction of bourgeois politics uh, in the United States of America in the sense that it delivers not only contradictions, but it, it delivers unpalatable uh, alternatives as well. Whereas a healthier system would help to imbue a healthier body politic with more reasonable and rational alternatives. But alas, as of today, those reasonable and rational alternatives do not seem to have turbocharged momentum. What do you think happens if um, the uh, Middle East does somewhat explode and we are looking at, you know, 10, 15, you know, some, um, number on gas as an example and diesel fuel that basically would wipe out our economy i mean 15 you know if, if gas is 15 dollars a, a gallon no one can afford 
to do the things that would be necessary. And of course, the price of everything else, it would be an economic um, catastrophe at that point. And it's not out of the realm of possibility in the very near future that we could be facing something that I think would create the dynamics for an economic unraveling. You know, people in the streets fighting, angry violence. I mean, I never thought I could live, possibly potentially live to see the day that this country could come unglued. But an economic crash of that mag crash of that magnitude is it unreasonable to think that that is the potential? Well, uh, speaking of which, you know that the number one film at the box office as we speak is Civil War, which basically uh, predicts the kind of unraveling that you have suggested, although admittedly it tries to be a typical uh, capitalist cinematic extravaganza by not pointing the finger of accusation at the right wing so that right wingers can pay their 10 to $15 at the box office in order to watch this unfold on the silver screen. And, and, and certainly not the ruling elite. <laughs> I'm sure they're not looking bad. I'm sure the ruling elite, uh, you know, who would who would be paying for this film, the, that there's certainly no blame coming in their direction. Well, of course, they're not going to inculpate themselves. They're going to exculpate themselves. But in any case, uh, there's a lot of loose talk in this country about the so-called invisible hand of the marketplace. I think that if there is an invisible hand, it's an invisible hand of Texas oil men. Uh, who manipulate from behind the scenes. Because the scenario that's unfolding right now is made to order for the Permian Basin, that is to say this oil-rich region of West Texas. What I mean is you have the Ukrainians uh, shooting missiles into uh, Russian oil depots uh, with the intent of hampering Russian petroleum production. Keep in mind that the oil market is a unitary market to a certain degree. And so if you remove or wound a major player, such as Russia, then it's going to make more valuable the oil in West Texas, just like with removing Russian natural gas from Germany. Uh, this has been a bonanza for West uh, Louisiana and East Texas natural gas producers. Likewise, we began by talking about Iran and sanctions against Iran, attempts to wound Iran, attempts, heaven forfend, overthrow the Islamic Republic itself will obviously be quite damaging to a major oil producer, once again, to the advantage and to the benefit of West Texas oil men and to turn that coin over, if the Iranians are able to respond effectively, uh, perhaps uh, with regard to actions in the Straits of Hormuz or actions that their Yemeni allies could take against the US ally that is Saudi Arabia, uh, that too could wound oil supply globally to the benefit of US domestic uh, producers. And the United States uh, should take this very seriously because as I understand it, the strategic reserves of US petroleum are not very high right now, uh, which means that those photos of yore from the 1970s after the uh, boycott of 1973, where folks are pushing their limousines into gas stations that are shuttered that it's not beyond the realm of imagination to predict that a similar scenario could unfold, particularly once again, seeing these tensions being ratcheted up against two major oil producers, surprise, surprise, shock, shock, speaking of Russia and Iran. Uh, and I got to add this. And I just read today that the U.S. says they're going to reimpose the sanctions on Venezuela to stop Venezuela from selling oil. The other interesting thing, part of it is this, certainly I know Russia doesn't want an instability, but the one thing they have a lot of is oil. And they'll be the guy in town with most of the oil, uh, but, but certainly they don't want instability. Um, 
and I know we've spent a lot of time on this, but in light of what's going on in Iran right now, I think it is, you know, potentially going on right now. I think it's critical to, to, to address, address that, uh, address this. The, um, uh, uh, um, the 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 what was I, I was going to say? Well, let's do this. So this it is what it is. We'll find out what's happening before we go. We only have a few minutes left. I did want to I left. I did want to ask you about um, Africa. If we could touch on that, um, you've got um, what's going. You know, certainly you've got the Horn of Africa. You've got what's going on in the Sahel. But particularly, what are your thoughts on what's happening? We see um, there a whistleblower has now said that in Niger. Excuse me in. Uh, a whistleblower now says that the government of Niger has said to the U.S. troops to leave and that the U.S. government has said, yes, it's publicly said yes, but privately they won't leave. Meanwhile, there are Russian troops, Russian military advisors, Russian air defense systems showing up in Niger. Um, there seems to be, again, some hairy things going on in the Sahel region of Africa. Your thoughts on what's Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, et cetera, what's going on there? Well, as you know, more than most, uh, since July 2023, when you had this regime change in Niger, uh, there has been upset in the North Atlantic countries, France not least, because if you look at Burkina Faso and Mali and Niger, former French colonies, all... Uh, they have justifiable, justifiably a bone to pick with France. And speaking of energy, uh, Niger, you may recall, is a major producer of uranium, much of which had been going at a pittance to France to power electricity. But the new regime has increased the price of this uranium, uh, which means more money in their coffers to address education and health care, but alternatively giving the pirates in Paris an excuse to raise electricity prices. This is part of this ongoing crisis of French neocolonialism in Africa. Now, historically, the United States has not been unwilling to stab France in the back when it comes to its neocolonial empire. Recall that uh, the man running for US president in 1960, John F. Kennedy, one of his calling cards, which deluded many progressives into thinking that he was one of them, was to be critical of the French role in Algeria. But actually, what Mr. Kennedy wanted to do was to replace France. And likewise, with regard to Niger, you see that the United States was not necessarily upset when Niger booted out the French because they thought they, they could retain their drone base uh, in northern Niger, which monitors the Sahel region and as far east as Somalia on the Horn of Africa. But now we see that arriving in Niger are Russians who are not going to necessarily be happy with uh, sharing soil uh, with the U.S. military. And so uh, this is part and parcel of this unraveling of North Atlantic hegemony in a very important part of Africa. You saw the same thing in Senegal on the Atlantic coast uh, where a new leader has come in, into office in the last few weeks, President Fai, Prime Minister Sanko, uh, who too railed against France as part of their winning electoral campaign. Uh, we see that the French puppets in the neighborhood, speaking of President Wutera, of Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, are increasingly isolated. Apparently, according to certain press reports, he has a trap door in his office leading to a tunnel that directs him into the French embassy nearby. Uh, he may have to use that trap door and tunnel sooner rather than later, given the political trends in that part of Africa. And a spotlight also needs to be placed upon Nigeria the giant of the economic community of West African states with the president Tinubu, uh, who has been suspected of being correctly in the pocket of Uncle Sam. Recall that in the 1970s, he left Chicago under scandal because of allegations of a credible nature that he was involved in drug deals. And that particular case was then 
held like a Damocles sword over his neck when the United States was trying to get Nigeria to intervene to topple the new regime in Niger. Uh, he had the good sense to resist uh, though that kind of pressure, uh, but who knows what will happen going forward. And so once again, uh, to put a pin on this question and to return to where we began, uh, we're going through a fundamental shift in the global balance of forces. The imperialist powers are on the back foot. That does not necessarily mean that they will surrender. In fact, a wild beast is perhaps most dangerous when it's cornered. And certainly the domestic forces, which will have to face the utter ferocity of this wild beast, needs to be placed on guard. I, you know, when I um, I was talking to someone recently about the divide between the masses and the ruling elite, like in my life, I've never seen it to go, get to this extent in the United States. Right. Where particularly, I mean, all you have to do is look at Israel. But the support for the Ukraine conflict is is dying. People are concerned about, you know, we see the rise of homelessness. People don't have money. So we see that the the the, the people are looking for a complete different direction and they're not getting it. And my friend said, yes. That's called fascism, <laughs> that what we're looking at right now is a move towards a fascist society. Now, when I look at Ukraine, certainly people marching around with, you know, uh, all the iconography of the uh, of the Third Reich. We look at, you know, that term fascism and worse have been um, bandied about in reference to the regime now that is currently running Israel. And if you look at some of the Ben Gavirs and the Smotrishes, they were they're they're over the top. Um, do you see a rising before we end, uh, uh, you know, uh, a situation in the U.S. where we go? We see the censorship. We see the pushing back against protests. Do you see a more significant crackdown coming as the people get less, get more restive, get less comfortable with the pre precarious economic position they find themselves in as our rulers are out running around the world, lighting fires from, you know, from, from pole to pole? Well, if you take an accurate and true look at U.S. history, you will not be surprised by a possible rise of fascism. After all, it's a country uh, constructed on a mountain of cadavers of Native American nations, a country constructed on mass enslavement of black people. Indeed, you can make an argument that for the longest, there have been fascist-like conditions imposed upon black people. That's the import of lynching. That's the import of a disproportionate deployment of the death penalty against our community. That's the import of police terror. And you can make the similar argument that with our attempt to push back to a degree against these outrages, the elite forces and their foot soldiers have decided that the only alternative is to impose nationally uh, what had been thought to be have been reserved for those who had not been inducted into the hollowed halls of whiteness. And so it's no accident that one of the last books of late Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was on fascism, fascism a warning. It's no accident that uh, many who are not considered to be alarmists have beginning to ring the bell about a possible fascism. And of course, if you look at the weakness relatively of the labor movement in this country, no disrespect meant for the United Auto Workers and those who have been struggling against this trend. Once again, if you look at the spate of police killings, the uh, rise in the deployment of the death penalty, uh, certainly the aroma of fascism is in the air and we should necessarily be on guard in that respect.
Thank you much, uh, very much, Dr. Gerald Horn. Uh, uh, once again, he's a, uh, he's, a, he's a historian, he's a researcher, he's a professor, and uh, the author of, uh, of dozens of outstanding books. Once again, you look at the uh, thumbnail, the uh, Paul Robeson uh, book is, is, my, is, is my favorite. I'm sure we'll be getting back together soon. We have uh, things going on in the Middle East as we speak. If, in fact, uh, the reports seem to be if I look at Al Mayadeen across the top, uh, so it sounds like there's something going on. Uh, certainly, uh, explosion was heard, the cause of which unknown in southern Iraq. Um, there's Twitter says there's something going on in Iran. Senator Marco Rubio tweeted on network, Israel can attack Iran without entering its spare. It's, uh, Air Force Severn Agency is now reporting on the activation of the air defense systems in the Istvan province of Iran. Uh, so we'll see what goes on. There certainly seems that, you know, many of us suspected um, Israel being the loose cannon that it is, that the likelihood was that they were retaliating. If I one more thing I want to say about this, I think this is critical and I want to get your thoughts on it. The one thing that the Iran strike on Israel struck at, Israel has had an impunity. You know, my, my I grew up, my mother had school buses, a school bus company, right? And one thing I noticed uh, uh, in there, and that was there, there were the bad kids on the bus, you know, the kids that were always a problem. It never failed. I, I, I saw this when I was a kid, whatever the kid, my mother would, or the other drivers would talk about the kids, but it was always this, the worst kids on the bus when they went to the parent, brought them in, the parents always would defend them. Not my child. My child didn't do that. My child would never do that, right? So the worst kids on the bus were always the ones whose parents would never discipline them, would never even accept that their child was doing anything wrong. They, the child had a, bit of, had, a, had a certain level of impunity, right? Israel had the impunity. The U.S. empire is behind me. I can do anything I want. I can blow up your pipelines. I can kill your generals. I can blow up your soldiers here. There was impunity, right? And Iran came in and said, no more impunity. If you hit, you're going to get hit back. Because Israel was used to hitting, never getting hit back, hitting, never getting hit back. And I think when Iran struck them, what really upset Israel is the idea that they were losing their impunity that no more could they do whatever they wanted without repercussions. And now they're they're going to try to get it back. Even when all of their allies were saying, don't do it, you're causing us problems. The spoiled child said, I can do anything I want to. I want my impunity back and I'm going to go out and I'm going to get my, my impunity. Your thoughts on that? Last well, question, I know you're busy. <laughs> well, clearly, uh, Iran has been able to establish a muscular deterrence along the lines that you just suggested. And that's one of the reasons why it's so diabolical if the story turns out to be accurate, that Israel has once again been able to convince Uncle Sam that in return for not attacking Iran, which I don't think that they were inclined to do, they can now go into Rafah and Palestinians will be the ultimate victim of this kind of devilish scheme. But once again, I think what we should leave your audience with is this repetitive point, which is that there has been a fundamental shift in the global correlation of forces. The North Atlantic countries are on the back foot along with their allies, such as the Zionist state of Israel. And the only possible path forward is what they have been enduring, which is tactical victories at best, followed swiftly by strategic defeats. Yes, I tell you who's not sleeping well tonight, Vladimir Zelensky, because he knows that everything that happens in the Middle East that turns the heat, turns the volume up a bit, means he gets nothing. That when he calls a uh, foggy bottom, nobody, it's going to be like a. Um, you know, when they're getting spam calls, he's going to call fo Foggy Bottom. I need, I need, they're not even going to answer the phone on him anymore. That's, he's, he's yesterday's news, I, I, I suspect, Dr. Horn. Well, I think that's the understatement of the month, <laughs> if not the decade. 
Dr. Gerald Horn, everyone. You can go to Amazon, look up all of his books. He's got a ton of good books. I will recommend um, the uh, Paul Robeson. You can look on, in fact, you can uh, look on the um, uh, the thumbnail for this particular video and you can see the Paul Robeson book. I'm definitely going to re re recommend that because I'm a big fan of, of Paul Robeson. Thank you very much, Dr. Horn. Everyone, don't forget, share this on all your social media platforms. Certainly appreciate that. It's on Rumble. Follow me on Rumble. Follow me on Rockfin. Share these videos on all your social media platforms. Thank you. We're out.